Hey everyone, uh, I'm here to talk about Black Box and how a challenge is made. This uh, talk is titled UI Engineers Hate Him, UI Kit Engineers. Shout out to uh, Pim Kalmans for that title. It's a great title. Um, funny enough, came up with it before the talk and then realized uh, the challenge I'm about to talk about doesn't really use a lot of UI Kit. And I know a few people that work on UI Kit and I don't think they hate me. So maybe it's just a clickbait. So before we get started, if you haven't already, I'll give you a minute to grab Blackbox. It's free, some in-app purchases. And I apologize in advance for completely spoiling one of the challenges, but there's 70 something more for you to solve. So hopefully that's scanned. So hi everyone, I am Ryan McLeod. I'm warpling on everything, uh, feel free to DM me on Twitter, find me on Clubhouse, whatever is new, send me something. So I live in Amsterdam for, it's been two and a half years now in the Netherlands. Uh, before that I lived in California and a lot of Dutchies asked me why I would uh, move to the Netherlands. I think there's a lot of good reasons. There's, you have great bikes, sort of work-life balance, uh, amazing infrastructure, but there's, there's one reason that almost no one talks about that I think is, is really important. And that's the like super native iOS apps um, that are made here. I didn't even realize uh, NS was a sponsor, I promise, but you have this amazing NS app, which is sort of the transit app for uh, getting all over the Netherlands, whether it's by boat or tram or train. And it's just a really nice app for seeing where everything is going where your transfers are, uh, what the platform is. It's really well made um, versus uh, in the US, I'm very used to our Amtrak app with our nice uh, credit card point offer and some of these uh, very spacious, spacious views. Another app that I really like here is uh, Postanel, which is sort of like for checking your mail. It shows me like all of the mail scanned before it's delivered. I can like generate postcode or um, stamps that I can write it has widgets, it supports dark mode. Uh, USPS is on its way, with some really lovely web views and some, <laughs> some misaligned icons. Feel bad, feel bad uh, ripping on USPS, but there's other apps like uh, Ticket Swap, it's really, really nice. Uh, Mark Blotz, Dutch Craigslist, pretty, I mean, a lot of you probably don't like it if anyone in the Netherlands is maybe thinking that. But compared to uh, this, which is the U.S. alternative for it, it's uh, you're doing doing pretty well. So really, really nice community here, uh, and I think a lot of these people behind these apps are involved in Cocoa Heads. So thank you for letting me join you. So I am here to talk about Black Box, which is probably what I'm best known for. And Black Box is a very different kind of puzzle game where you generally don't touch the screen. It's uh, comprised of a lot of different puzzles that can vary on how they work based on like simple device movements to celestial movement. And it's really hard to say a lot more without spoiling it, but if you know, you know. So Black Box was awarded an Apple Design Award in 2017 for excellence in design uh, with an emphasis on accessibility that I'll get into later. It's been really wild five years coming up on I've gotten to meet all sorts of people around the world. People have gone some dangerous places for Black Box, uh, including Everest. I don't think Black Box sent them there, but I like to think it was partially inspired. <laughs> There's Black Box merch all around the world. There's a lot of really cool fan art. We have some Black Box dogs. And I think just generally Black Box has improved um, a lot of people's lives. At least I like to think that. And uh, yeah, there's there's also a black box tattoo out in the world, which very flattered have very mixed feelings about. So it's a it's been a big journey. It's kind of how it started versus uh, where we are now. Black box is something went from forty something challenges to around eighty. It's in about twenty two languages, from Dutch to Georgian. Uh, it's about to come out on iPad next week. Supports dynamic type. It's fully accessible. Supports switch control has a ton of sound, has new haptics. 
list goes on. Um, there's merch. You can buy it in app with cryptocurrency and Apple Pay. Point is, like the app has gotten very, very complicated. So I would like to talk about just one tiny part of this that I've wanted to talk about for a long time, which is one of my favorite challenges. And this one I internally call a dark scan. And it's part of a series of challenges that use the camera, but unlike similar challenges, it doesn't uh, use any QR codes. So you can see if you're wondering where it is on your grid or if you've just started, it's uh, this little turquoise one down in the corner here. So to talk about all this, I'm gonna break it up into four sections. I'll try to keep it to half an hour. About we're gonna talk about the level design, the visual design and implementation, the audio design, and accessibility. So starting with the level design, I think there's a common misconception that I am out of level ideas, probably because I haven't uh, put out a new challenge in a long time. It's a good reason for that. But the, the truth is I have too many ideas. There's always been a lot of ideas. I, I also have a wonderful discord of thousands of crazy people that submit fantastic ideas all the time. Um, the problem isn't ideas, it's, it's more figuring out how to implement them well and yeah, how to really execute on them. Uh, I, I promise when I say I have plenty of ideas, there are, uh, it's, a, it's not a it's limited resource. So I thought I'd talk about kind of where an idea comes from really briefly. I think this challenge of dark scan is fairly obvious in hindsight. And the idea is that you find or make a black square in your environments and you scan it. It's kind of just comes from the name of the app, Black Box. But I think the inspiration came from some other places too. This was around summer 2017. Uh, I just started making some merch. So there's this idea of like having to scan a logo on the merch or something like that. ML kit had just come out, thought maybe we could train a machine learning model type thing. It seemed really gimmicky, probably too hard or air prone. I remember a friend had one of those like uh, pin art board things where you like can push your hand into and see the impression. Uh, I think that was a big influence. <laughs> I honestly don't remember that much. There's plenty of other sources. Uh, just the other day I was looking at this sort of washing machine barrel fire pit and that kind of has some cool inspiration into some of these pixel effects. Point is inspiration kind of comes from everywhere. So as far as taking the idea and turning it into a plan, it's interesting because if you have this sort of idea of you have a black square and you wanna make an app that's as intuitive as possible to find it and scan it, you could just provide those as instructions make a camera view, make it kind of turn green when the thing is scanned, but it wouldn't really be any fun. You would just scan it and it would be done. And a big part of creating a puzzle is sort of uh, creating a gap in that understanding. So one way I like to think about it is like this. Um, if you have, you want to design the most intuitive interface possible. And in black box, I always try to do that without the use of any language. So something generally visual. And you wanna be able to take this interface and then sort of break it. So if you imagine you have this uh, fort here in Hronia, if you have this sort of lovely path into its center where the answer is, if you took that interface then and sort of put a moat around it and split it up so it became less intuitive, and then you have this gap now, which you can let the player connect and that sort of is the aha moment that makes Black Box uh, so satisfying and fun to play. Now, a lot of different puzzles take different strategies with this sort of stuff. So if you imagine like a jigsaw puzzle, a jigsaw puzzle, like everyone knows how to solve it. It's mostly just uh, time and difficulty, I guess, versus like some of these desk toys that are like rope and metal. Uh, it's not clear how to solve it. And you might kind of have a strategy, but you just mess with it for a while. And then eventually I find these frustrating because I think they just kind of like come apart in your hands. 
and then often you don't know how you did it. That's not super satisfying. And the approach I like to take with black box is a little bit more like uh, baby rattles. So this is sort of proprioception and how we learn proprioception. So the idea with these, if you're not familiar, is like they're kind of crinkly or they have bells or make sounds and you put them on a baby's uh, wrist or their legs. And as they're like mushy, brain is just trying stuff and limbs are flailing, they can sort of associate more sensory input with the thing that they're doing. And eventually we learn how the controls work and hopefully we can like solve problems in the world. So I like to think about black boxes uh, interfaces sort of like that, where it's providing this sort of rattle where you are able to learn how your world is affecting the challenge and it guides you to figuring out that solution. And then actually carrying out the solution is not the difficult part. Sometimes it is, but mostly it's figuring it out and then just executing it. So once there's a good idea, the question is kind of how to build it next. And this involves like looking through SDKs and APIs usually to see if the problem is uh, feasible. And for anyone that doesn't know, that's just kind of the tools available to anyone making an iPhone app to do things with the sensors. So when I was evaluating this idea to see if it was feasible, I first looked at OpenCV, Open Commuter Vision. It's an open source project for detecting things in camera feeds. Um, I'd done some work with it before and knew that scanning objects with hard edges was easy, but it was kind of a bulky, big framework to use for this. Core image detector is Apple's sort of built-in thing, which I knew worked really well with still images, but was like quite jittery with um, live video and such. And then the last but not least is like straight up pixel buffers. So that just means like the actual color values of the grid of pixels making up the image. And from that, you can do anything with enough math. So once sort of there was a understanding that this challenge was going to be possible to implement in the way I wanted, the next thing was to figure out the visuals of it. And one of the things that's nice about working by myself, not with a giant team, is this kind of can happen at the same time as the level design phase. And these can work really nicely in tandem. So I kind of began exploring them at the same time. Like I mentioned, uh, this sort of pin art thing had been in my mind, and I had made some other challenges that had these pixelated views. So that seemed like a really obvious idea, but not quite right, wasn't satisfied with it. I started browsing uh, with my favorite algorithm, Pinterest. It's always scary because you just scroll and it seems to get to know you better and better. And I found something that kind of stuck out to me, which was this, this grid thing which you might think maybe this is someone's uh, art or something, but it turns out it was just this uh, downloadable pattern pack. So shout out to David ZYDD. So I got kind of fixated on this and normally I would jump to paper first, but since this, since this idea was just black squares, I uh, just hopped directly into sketch. From there, I sort of drew out some squares, threw that on my phone with the sketch mirror, sort of looked at how it felt and sort of arrived at these two visual elements. So from here, I had this idea of these grid of black squares that would get uh, larger and smaller based on the luminosity of like the pixels behind them. And this, this reticle like on a camera. So the idea was that this grid would kind of represent the camera feed and what was happening and guide you towards what in the world was affecting this challenge. And the reticles could grow to kind of complete themselves into a square when you were close to solving the answer. And this works really well because if you've ever seen like an Apple watch with the rings, humans really hate like incomplete shapes, especially when you have this nice like motion uh, easing on this. So it kind of, it very quickly comes close together. And then the last 10% is kind of 50% of the work. And one way to think of this is kind of like the, 
the how and the what of it. One is what input and how the sensor works. And the other is what is your goal here? And a fun side effect of this design was, I don't remember how intentional this was, but just the idea that like, you're looking at a bunch of black squares and like you're trying to find a black square. It has a nice, nice meta-ness to it where the answer is staring you in the face the whole time. So after thinking about it a lot further, doing a lot of whiteboard and paper math and apparently posting artsy photos of it on Instagram, uh, I just found all these. <laughs> it seemed the most natural to use just the straight pixel buffers uh, to drive it. And that would keep the visual really tight to the actual sensor input. And from there, the idea of building it was basically to use AV capture session, which generally provides the kind of camera feed that you would show filtered images on. That can come in different sizes on different devices. So I would do kind of an aspect fill on that and crop the image. From there, it's as simple as applying a bunch of core image filters. So I kind of uh, changed the image to be monochrome, boosted the gamma of it, sort of wash out the really light elements and then resize it down. And what you end up with is this really nice uh, 2D array of luminosity values. Now from here, this can be pumped straight to this uh, sprite kit scene of SK shape nodes. And I think I must have, for the UI kit part of this talk, I must have tried it with core animation layers when I first built it and seen a lot of performance issues because I tend to avoid scene kit uh, at all costs unless I need to do a bunch of physics. But it works really well in this case because it's very straightforward. So for the other visual, I'm able to take that array of luminosity values and do a bunch of math and get this nice progress value that ranges from zero to one for how close to completion the player is. And that can drive this reticle to kind of open and close and also drive a bunch of the uh, audio and other things. So the math, just to clarify, uh, I first had this sort of thing where it was just looking at an average luminosity, luminosity of the section where the square is supposed to be scanned. Very quickly discovered that if you run this and your phone is laying on the table and the entire screen is black, then you just solve the challenge. So not very fun very easily solved by also checking this outer ring, making sure it's above a certain luminosity, and then checking the contrast between those two and coming up with that value. There's a little bit more to this, but that's the gist of it. So moving through these quickly. Um, all of the audio in Black Box is done by my sound engineer, Gus Callahan, and all of it is powered by AudioKit. AudioKit is this insane open source audio library for iOS that powers a lot of the software that uh, DJs you know and love use. And it also means every single challenge in Blackbox can be powered by its own digital synthesizer. So if you imagine a setup of having a keyboard and filters and wires running between all these different things, it basically allows you to build any of those completely digitally in software. This is a large part about of uh, what makes black box accessible, uh, uh, accessible to blind players. These kind of alternative sonic interfaces that I'll talk about. So the audio in this challenge, if you're not familiar, this is a little clip of what it sounds like. You can hear it kind of uh, a change. You can hear this kind of repeating sound come in. So that whole thing is made out of four like static sounds, basically, which is pretty insane. And how that's built up, having a, trying to advance the slide here. Oh. 
I'm having a, okay, there we go. So, uh, I'll have to do this through you guys. Um, you have this first player here that if we go, we'll uh, play it sound. So it does this repeating sound. And then you have this uh, other player that is looping. So we call this one the sort of donk player. Um, so this one gets repeated. It just plays the entire time. And then we also have these other ones. If we, uh, there we go. So this one is kind of the, the ambient player that plays the entire time. And then we have another one that this one gets uh, mixed in. It's very similar. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out some slide control issues here. So this all gets fed into a mixer, which if you think of, it's kind of like a, a USB hub of sorts. So all this audio comes in and all of it eventually needs to go out um, to whatever your output is. So that could be the speakers or AirPods or whatever is connected. So what's interesting here is the opening player can be, its output can be directly wired into the mixer. And that just means when it gets played, it immediately gets heard. But some of these other ones we want to do more advanced things with. So uh, something like this donk player is just going to continue to make this sound, but we can feed it into a ver speed, which will we can adjust how quickly the sound is played back. And then that can be wired into a bit crush, bit crusher, which sort of does like an 8-bit type effect and lowers the sort of resolution of the sound, kind of adds a nice chiptune effect. Um, I think this is some of the genius in Gus's sound design where this kind of matches in parallel with the visuals where you have this very pixelated view. And this is like literally pixelating the sound. So that gets connected directly to the mixer. And then the next thing we have to deal with are these, these two players. So there's this dry, wet mixer that they both get fed into. Uh, dry, wet, like confused me for a really long time. A better way to think about it is just like hot, cold. So you can kind of uh, mix these two together however you want. And that gets fed into a vera speed. So we can adjust the speed along with the donk player. It gets passed through a delay and eventually also gets bit crushed and fed into the mixer. And then you have this entire thing playing the whole time. And as everything else is happening, we can uh, adjust all the parameters on these. So as the player gets closer to solving the challenge, the speed can be increased, the volumes can be changed, the mix can be adjusted. And that's how you end up with that sound, which I'm going to play again so you can kind of listen to and see if you can hear some of the, the repeating players come in and sort of change as it gets closer to the answer. So maybe now you can understand a little bit of the craziness and some of the sound design in Black Box there. So last but definitely not least, I wanted to talk about the accessibility in Black Box. Um, when I know I, I laid out the talk like this, I'm still not quite sure this is the right way to do this, but really accessibility is a consideration at all of these steps the entire time. Um, I think it's a little easier to talk about it at the end like this. But it's something that I think about when designing the levels, when thinking of the visuals, and especially the audio and voice control and stuff like that. And accessibility is about making our apps just uh, able to be used by everyone. 
depending on if that state is sort of permanent or temporary. And if I couldn't make this challenge accessible, if I couldn't have thought of a way to do it, I wouldn't have made it. So accessibility, I think we tend, those that know it uh, in the iOS world tend to think of it as voiceover and labeling our elements and such, but it's a lot more than that. It's the, the overall design and in black box, it's also supporting things like switch control and full dynamic type and respecting when users request reduced motion and reduced transparency and things like that. In Blackbox, it's, it's very interesting. So some of these challenges are the game originally was completely visual. And when some players, uh, blind players approached me and asked if the game was accessible, I had to start thinking if this was something that actually was a blocker or if this was something that I could solve. And I think part of the determination in making Blackbox fully accessible was kind of a proof that if this game can be, then your apps definitely can also. This is, you might be wondering how this works though. So um, one of the first challenges in Blackbox is this red challenge here. And this involves moving the device around and seeing this different, this, um, these visuals move around to sort of tell the orientation. And if you're blind, there's this sonic interface. And even if you're not, this also helps. So hopefully you can hear this here. This uh, sort of guides you where the sounds get louder and sound more pleasing as you get close to the edges and close to your answers. This challenge has no voiceover in it whatsoever, and it's completely solvable. I still remember the, the first time I watched uh, a blind tester solve this challenge and he got through it with ease. And it really blew my mind to think about, I've watched so many hundreds of people solve this challenge um, and they have all solved it through seeing this visual. And this person had a completely different interface to understanding the whole thing and was able to solve it and have the same satisfaction. Other challenges uh, rely on voiceover a little bit more. Here you can hear some of them. Voice over on. So Black a lot of these elements are labeled. Clue. Large slider, 78% on. By Clue. swiping around Medium and navigating, switch. Off. Um, players can Clue. listen into Small switch. what on. the state of these different Light items are. Unsolved. And there's also Align sounds that top help. Of large slider and left. So this challenge poses a really interesting problem um, because it is completely visual and it's also very finicky. It wants this pixel level precision of this black box being exactly in this reticle. And if you are uh, visually impaired, this is probably gonna be pretty difficult to line up correctly. But when I was in that phase of thinking through the APIs and what I could use, I had the idea to use core image detector as sort of an alternative interface. And it's typically a bit of a no-no to like, create a different way of doing something versus making the primary way accessible. Um, but I think in this case, it's okay because the challenge is a little bit, uh, it asks for a little bit more as far as like that square being really straight and such, but it's more forgiving in that the square can be anywhere on screen. And so the way I thought to do that was with the core image detector. Here you'll see, I sort of made a little metal view for um, seeing the camera view and overlaying what the core image detector sees. And these are these polygons are squares that it thinks are or thinks are potential squares, maybe. And with this sort of debug test here, I was able to see um, that this would be a plausible way to make this work with some additional work. So if this is normally what the challenge visual looks like to everyone, I have sort of a debug mode I can turn on that makes it look like this. And with CI detector, you get these, these polygons, but you just get points, corners. So in this case, I get these corner positions when it thinks there's a potential square. And from there, I can generate edge lengths. I can get corner angles. I can look for sort of the average color of that shape. And I can generate a whole bunch of other things, including orthogonality, which is just how uh, parallel that shape is and the squareness of the rectangle. From there, we can basically do a different kind of math 
and come up with a new progress based on how square the rectangle is and its darkness and such. And that can drive the visuals, um, but it can also drive the, the audio from the audio graph that I talked about. And it can provide some additional voiceover feedback. So now the game can kind of announce these things uh, as the player is moving the phone around, they're hearing sound change a little bit. And when it changes just enough and something is just plausible enough, it might announce one of these. And then with that and the sonic interface, players can kind of be guided towards a solution. And here I'm gonna play uh, what that sounds like. Challenge type 47, clue. Black squares on a grid changing in size based on something. Fine. Sound like a lot. Large, semi-dark colored square detected. Square is not parallel with camera. Small, semi-dark colored square detected. Square is not parallel with camera. Small, semi-dark colored square detected. Small, 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 semi-dark colored square detected. Square Still is not parallel with of, camera. Uh, some threshold adjustment there. But, so. That's one challenge. Um, there are many, many more that are just as complex or a lot simpler. I hope that that gave you some insight into how Blackbox functions and maybe gave you some ideas for your apps and uh, serves as a nice example of how you can make something like this possible and make it completely accessible. So if anyone has uh, questions or comments, I think I will be around answering some of those now. Ah, finding my questions here. Cool, so I think I'm reading these here. So let's see what we had. <laughs> Unit tests. Um, I wish I could claim that there are tests. I initially wrote some tests, but being an independent developer, there are there are no tests. There's a lot of beta testers and a lot of thinking carefully, but uh, next project will definitely start with tests. Um, there's a question on YouTube of, did Apple feature this app? Yes, uh, quite a few times. That's been one of the things that helps me do this independently are those uh, features. So it's been um, game of the day and featured in a few other uh, puzzle categories and stuff like that, along with the design award is a nice feature. Let's see what else we have here. We have, uh, did he create some kind of nice setup to easily jump into a certain level during development? Yeah, there, there's a lot of, um, I have a whole bunch of hidden things in the debug build that allow me to uh, like remove transitions, to videotape things for promo materials. That challenge specifically, I use um, Swift tweaks and FB tweaks, and those I can like jump in and adjust a lot of different thresholds and parameters, which during testing is a lot faster than recompiling the app over and over. Um, someone asked, if the iPad app is built with Swift UI, um, no. <laughs> it took me probably over two years to get everything ready for uh, for iPad, but I haven't touched Swift UI too much yet, to be honest. I found some of the animation stuff that I do is a little difficult, but when I have some downtime, I would like to start messing with it more. The whole app was also originally written in Objective C because um, I started on it six years ago or so, and Swift was brand new. But now about half of it and most of what I work in day to day is Swift. <laughs> awesome. Um, it's a debug mode accessible in the App Store version. I'm not quite sure what you mean, but there's a uh, like the accessible or the I have developer menus in the app. I think. I think actually a lot of them are localized and they're definitely accessible because they use all the same UI that the rest of the game uses. Um, there's someone, Eugene writes that their 12 uh, year old daughter started to learn Swift Playgrounds from Blackbox, which is really, really cool. I use Playgrounds to test stuff um, in Blackbox. So that's awesome. And then 
If, uh, did you start to work on it full time straight away? Uh, basically, it, I thought it might not be possible, but I was I was living pretty cheaply in California. Um, definitely thought there would be this like giant amount of becoming a millionaire gold rush type thing if it succeeded, and then very quickly realized that you have kind of this that graph of like getting featured by Apple and then drops off and then learning like, oh, this is actually just going to be like a lot of work, but um, did see the path forward immediately and was able to do that. Uh, had a few times of like applying to jobs and stuff and thinking it wasn't going to work anymore, but um, managed to pull it through. And uh, how long did it take to build the first 40 levels? I think that's really interesting because the, the first 40 something levels I built in a year with the rest of the game and since then, my development has slowed considerably. Um, having supporting all the sort of accessibility stuff, having 22 localized languages, supporting more different kinds of hardware, uh, doing all the sounds, all these things have made it uh, take a lot longer to add challenges. So I think 40 in the first year working on it, and then about 40 in the next four years. So things have slowed down. Yeah, there's a lot of questions uh, from Kareem. Have you used any machine learning models? Um, I haven't. I've always been curious to, but I always found it a little bit, uh, found them a little finicky and difficult. And I think I've just kind of been intimidated. I've been wanting to mess with uh, low AI, which I think makes that a lot more accessible, but it might, might be better as a different game. Not sure. Then, um, when you started building it, did you look into other games that are somewhat similar? Perlu, maybe. Uh, Perlu rings a bell. I there was, I'm trying to remember what. There were some things that inspired it. One was like uh, the to-do list clear. Uh, they had some like secret themes that unlocked if you like open the app really late at night. And then there was this Inception app uh, for the movie as a promotion. And that had some really weird things in it. Like if you opened it while it was raining, uh, it unlocked something. If you opened it in Africa, it unlocked something. And I thought that was really cool. Along with like all these other apps from the beginning of the app store that there was like a pocket warmer that just like turned on all the sensors. There was like a bulldozer that used a, the vibration motor to like push the phone across the table. It was like, there was an air blower for like blowing out candles. Like people were doing really cool stuff. And then all of a sudden, everyone was just doing like lowest common denominator, like fits under a glass screen, works on the web, works on Android, does everything, uh, not taking advantage of any of the interesting sensors. And I really wanted to do that. Um, there was one app, uh, Progress 100, that I discovered like halfway through uh, making Black Box that it wasn't inspired by, but is kind of very similar and cool. Uh, is the app going to use the LiDAR sensor in the future? This has been asked quite a bit. I tend to avoid hardware that I figure most people don't have um, once it sort of reaches a majority. So maybe in a few years, it would be really cool to do. But it also might be really cool just to make a new AR something. Uh, which API do you think Apple would need to add at the next WWDC. Oh man, I would love access to the temperature sensors. <laughs> there is an act, well, there is a temperature sensor. Uh, it only gives you four temperature states. So I've kind of avoided making a challenge with that because I'm afraid someone will put their phone in an oven since people have done other weird things. Um, how can you live cheaply in California? <laughs> Good question coming from here. It's, uh, I think when you live with three other people out of college in a small town, it's it's not not totally out of the question, especially with how uh, tech and being an iOS developer uh, tends to pay. You can always do some contracting. Um, do you have challenges that are available exclusively in one language? No, that, I think that would be a little bit limiting. Um, I think that you mean like spoken languages, but no, there's one challenge that kind of 
involves that, but uh, I like to keep it open to everyone. And, then, and I think we have one more here. Uh, what's, what is the level that was the most hard to debug? Oh, I have to think about that. Uh, let's see. This one is still, I think, could use some calibration. Um, oh man, there's another one that uses QR codes, and they have to be. You have to scan other people's QR codes, and they they generate nonces and they expire and stuff. I was trying to do it without a server. Um, that one was kind of hard to get working as as I wanted it to with all the physics, but. I think it looks pretty good now. So I think I think that's it. If anyone else has questions, uh, feel free to find me on on Twitter or anywhere else. I'm Warpling, should be up there somewhere. So thank you for this opportunity. Thanks for sticking around.